two. Um, Pat, can you read Philippians 4, 18 through 23, please? Okay. My fingers to turn the page first, so I'm not stopping in the middle here. Mm -hmm. Went all the way to Colossians, so that didn't help. Okay. Uh, starting at 18? Yep. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus. Yeah, try it this time. Uh, the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints uh, in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So that finishes up the letter to the Philippians. More famous passages in there. Um, there's, a, there's a wealth of passages that are just very beloved to Christians, I know. Um, so this, starting at the bottom of page 85, if you have the book, based on Paul's language in verses 11 to 18, what can be determined about the extent of the Philippians' recent gift to the church? Or to Paul, sorry. Uh, just that they were so generous. Yes. You know, they, um, lots, of, uh, lots of churches gave, gave to him when he came into town and was ministering to them. And then as he moved on, you know, he was kind of forgotten. But this first church... They, they were just exceedingly generous with everything, with uh, their prayers and with their acts of service and with their food and their kindness and money and everything he needed. And um, we're going to get to uh, how that is actually being pointed back to glory to God, So, which is a beautiful part of this next section. Uh, again, based on, on the top of page 86, again, based on Paul's own words, how did he come to be so content? Verses 11 to 13. We know that his testimony isn't sinful boasting, but how do we know that it isn't? He experienced such a broad variety of circumstances, some easy, some hard, some very hard, and he found, my God will meet all my needs. That's one of those verses that we love here, that he's survived. He's still standing, as Elton John would say. Um, that in all these experiences, he he knew God was looking after him, and so he learned how to um, be content and to understand, I can trust God. Like our word imitate, it isn't that he had horrible circumstances, crashed, and then came back to the message right. and back to the, the purpose he was out there. He was sharing that gospel and praising God through every one of them. People could see that at the time. He didn't fall away. He kept focused in the right place. He's saying that my God will meet all your needs just like he's met all my needs. And how did he do that? He used the Philippian church. God working through the church. So that was beautiful. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this, uh, these verses that make reference to the sacrifice. Um, verses, I think, 17 and 18. Uh, and then, you know, you could, you could spend a year talking about this. <laughs> this is a very... Uh, uh, deep and uh, theologically rich idea that is being presented here in a couple of different verses. So can you go ahead and read verse 17 and 18? Am I in the right place? 2, 17 and 18? I think it's 18. Okay. I'll do 17. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am ampli uh, amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus uh, <laughs> the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. What's this? Because <laughs> we don't do this before. anymore, do we? <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, luckily we got to talk about this a lot when we were studying through the covenants. So back in the Old Testament times, um, the way to pay for sin and to worship God, um, his prescribed way was through sacrifices. And so this idea of, of a sacrifice that's a pleasing aroma um, would be the idea that God is accepting the sacrifice, saying, thank you, payment received, uh, because of the sincerity of the person uh, who is presenting the sacrifice. And um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but, but Paul is saying, my 
life is, uh, this is a pleasing sacrifice. I am pouring myself out like a drink offering. It says um, earlier in Philippians, and then also in this section, he's saying, your offering is a pleasing sacrifice. It's a pleasant aroma. It, God smells it and says, I love this pleasing sacrifice. This is beautiful. Um, and in the Old Testament, when they had the law, this, that was how they showed thanksgiving to God was to go to these steps and do these sacrifices. And what Paul is showing is we're in a new world now. We've got Christ. That's not how we do it. This is how we show our thanksgiving and a pleasing sacrifice to God. Yeah. Here's what I had written down. In Old Testament times, God accepted animal sacrifices as symbolic. Jesus had yet to be sacrificed, so God accepted the life of an animal as a substitute, as payment for the sins of a person. So Paul is regarding his life as a sacrifice being poured out for Christ. Um, and as we know, Israel, um, during a long period, started sort of just going through the motions and here's another sacrifice, here's another sacrifice, but there, um, God did not find that a pleasant smell in his nostrils because um, there wasn't, it wasn't sincere. They weren't repenting of their sins. They weren't asking for forgiveness. They were just, you know, here you go. Here's your sacrifice. I'm going to get on with my day. And so, um, so what makes it acceptable to God is the sincerity of the, the sacrifice. So Paul's life and the Philippian church's life is a beautiful and pleasing sacrifice. I want to read another definition here. Sometimes I think we think of sacrifice. All right, so I'm going to ask you to give up doing what you love. And then there's no other half to it. It's just like, I'm just telling you, you have to sacrifice, you have to give it up. Uh, but there's, there's another component to the definition of sacrifice. An act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. So like that's sheltering in place. That's a sacrifice for us extroverts who want to be out there doing stuff all the time. Um, but there's something that matters more. There are people whose health would not be able to withstand, even if I contracted the virus and I didn't get sick, but I'm passing it on to them. Uh, so that's the idea of a sacrifice. There's a bigger goal at stake here. So when Paul is doing all this, it's because he has uh, apprehended Christ. And so he sees that as, I've already got the most wonderful thing. I don't mind sacrificing this other, other stuff because of... Um, the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. I'm forgiven. I'm free. I, I have a new heart. I have a new relationship with God. I can go boldly in prayer. I have heaven. I have my church family, you know. Lots of things. Well, it brings that freedom word out. We're hearing a lot in the news today because you've got the big uh, protests that free our country. We need freedom. You know, we deserve freedom. And it's <laughs> freedom to do whatever they think is important or whatever they want to do. And there might be some out there with good intent. I don't want to say that. But there's some out there that they interview that flat out say, nobody can tell me nothing and this is what's best for the world. This is what I get what I want. And they'll tell you that straight to the camera. And it's like, what an incredible example we can be to show that we're free to make better choices. And we have God's strength so that we can be free that way. Right. And it doesn't matter if I'm sheltering at home that's not lack of freedom. I still have freedom. Yes, and you can shelter at home as a burden, or you can shelter at home free. Yeah. Um, you belong to the Lord. You can reach out to people all you want. They, we are, I got a roof over my head. I got lots of food. I got companionship. It's, we're not suffering really. Yeah. Not compared to some people who are really suffering. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it does involve sacrifice, and sacrifice involves a bigger goal. All right, so you may have noticed, if you're following along in your book, that I jumped down a question. Uh, we're going to go back to <laughs> question two and four are really related. So um, I'll start with uh, question two. The ideas in verses 17 to 19 are also found in 2 Corinthians 9, 5 to 15, which I have, in greater detail. Read both passages and compare. What themes and language do they share? So we're switching subjects now. We are looking at the idea that God's generosity happens through people. It also happens, uh, it happens in lots of ways, but through people is uh, one of the main ways that God's generosity is experienced by people. So I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 9, 5 to 15. 
So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat it. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God, for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. So the idea here is when God's people give generously to those in need, God is on display. God's work, his heart is on display. So we have some choices. We can be stingy. Uh, and it talks about this, the small amount of seeds leads to a small amount of, of uh, harvest. Yeah, we can be stingy or generous in our giving. Um, and God will supply all of our needs. I think human nature, that term gets thrown out a lot, but is to think of self first. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what taking Jesus Christ on as our Lord and Savior, we have figured out that if we don't do that, life is better for all. And we can show His glory through what goes on. And so, uh, always hoarding. Right. <laughs> I want to make sure my needs are met first and then maybe I'll think about somebody else. Uh, unfortunately, human nature lets us never get to the point where we think we have enough. Right. It's always about us. And as Christians, what an, an incredible example we're placing in the world when we reach out to others first. And our needs get met. And if they're, if you have a true need that's not being met right now, you can pick up a phone, you can con contact somebody, and things will happen. Because you can reach out if you have mm -hmm. true needs. But reaching out also means reaching out where you can, which is sometimes just a phone call to somebody who's sheltering at home alone, or yeah. the little things that just make their world great without you having to give something. Mm -hmm. You're giving you, which is something. Yeah, and when we're doing that, we're being the church. Yeah. Um, I, there was a family that I uh, took some things over to the other day, and when I got to the door, <laughs> one of the girls answered and said, the church is here! <laughs> Or somebody else when I called when she had a death in her family. The church is on the phone. Oh, the church wants to pray with us. And so in a very real way, uh, this family is seeing the love of God uh, being acted out by the church, in this case me. People are figuring out the church isn't the building. Right, right. And that's what the opportunity that has come here is that the church is not the building. We can still be the church without coming to this structure once a week. It almost made me cry when I said, like, can I pray for your family? And she said, well, let me put you on the speakerphone. You guys, it's the church. <laughs> awesome. That's cool. Good example. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's go down and have a look at the bottom question on the page here. Um, talking more about what it means to live a generous life because God will meet all our needs. So then we are freed up to live these generous lives. In verses uh, 14 through 20, Paul mingles thanks to the Philippians and praise to God. He does the same in other letters. But why? Why is Paul teaching us by this model? And what is different about what he's doing? What is different about doing one without the other? So he's saying that God has used you, Philippian church, to meet my needs. And in the same way, God is going to use you to meet others' needs and use others to meet your needs. And so we're all woven together in this beautiful tapestry of uh, caring for each other. Um, I would put you ahead of me, and if you put me ahead of you, everybody gets looked after. Yeah. 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 
So um, can you think of a time that God used others to meet your needs? Uh, I think one of the biggest ones that hits me is when I was a um, young adult with two small children and working nights and my husband was a school teacher working days and so forth and our schedules didn't mesh and therefore I had two children that needed before school and after school care at a time when we were lucky to make it paycheck to paycheck, uh, very tight times. And a neighbor, our driveway sat against each other, she was right across the driveway, said, I'm retired, my husband's retired, we're here, we'd be glad to watch your kids. So John would leave for work and the kids would either go over or just, you know, open up the shades, <laughs> way better or whatever, uh, was appropriate at the time. And then I would come from night shift a little while later and, and then I'd be home with the kids during the day. And at the end of the day, John would come home, I could go to sleep, but they made a difference. They took that little hole in our life, that gap that we couldn't fill and couldn't afford to hire, mm -hmm. and just made life wonderful for us. And it, she loved our kids. So it was like, you know, grandma and two more grandkids, and. Uh, you know, you're having a bad day, well, we'll make a breakfast tomorrow. You just send them on over, I'll feed them. You know, just incredible open heart at a time when we just couldn't get the ends to meet any other way. And uh, made a lifetime friendship out of it, too. Wow. Wow. See, that's that's the generosity of God on display. So, so my evening prayers would be, thank you, Lord, for these wonderful people who have done this wonderful blessing, and thank you for prompting them to do that. Yeah. And just the the fact that God is involved in that as well. Yeah, let's see. Um, uh, time God's used you to meet, use others to meet your needs. I was teaching a drama class and I had a really got cold and just felt really awful, but there was only two weeks till the production, so we had to go ahead. And uh, one of the moms said, are you okay? And I'm like, try to be okay, I'm gonna be all right. Um, and she's a very sweet lady. I've known her for years. Uh, when I got back, when the class was over, I got back to my car. Here was this big bag of salad and soup and breadsticks and a big bottle of Coke. And started, go home and feed your family tonight. And I just, I, yeah. I thanked her and then I thanked God. Like, mm -hmm. thank you, God, for this sweet lady. And I, I know the Lord just prompted her to do that. She's, uh, we share the same faith and, and she's just so, so generous. And I, I was so thrilled that somebody would think of me in that kind way. Just, you know. That was, that was huge. Um, can you think of how God has used you to meet someone else's needs? Well, there's a couple. I could tie it to the first one. My lifelong friend next door, her husband got ALS and lost the use of his extremities and speaking, but he had the very long-acting form of ALS, so he came around for 10 years in this condition. And so we would go over, like she had done with our kids, we turned around and went over and got out the big lift and helped move him from his recliner in the living room into bed, got him settled each night, and in the morning we'd bring him back out before we went to work and stuff so that we could return in some ways that love that she had had for us and praise God, both of us, uh, through the whole time that we had the, what we needed. Another example that I, I um, think about is I got prompted by a study that I did a while back uh, about something called God's Pocket. And yeah, you told me about this. This is neat. I have a little envelope that every now and then when I feel moved, we add water, or add water. We add money to the envelope and it just sits there. That's God's Pocket. And when a need comes along from someone else, financial need, uh, we could pull out of that and help them. And uh, they'd say, should we pay it back? Should we whatever? Uh, no, that, that's not mine. I don't want money. <laughs> that's God's Pocket. Pay it forward to someone else. And it's been incredible to watch how that's been used over the years. We had people who couldn't get groceries once, and that got them a week's worth of groceries. Uh, sometime, uh, one time we found a girl whose family just wouldn't take her to get her eyes tested because they couldn't afford the glasses, and she was having terrible times at school. And so uh, my daughter became aware of that because she's a teacher in that school, and so uh, she arranged it with the parents that there was this thing called God's Pocket. She didn't say who had it, but God's Pocket's over here. And uh, take her and have her tested to see what it was. And then we, we paid for the glasses out of that. And her grades like went from some oh, she and her personal, <laughs> she her personal esteem went up because she was so 
closed in because she couldn't see and didn't want to be embarrassed by people not knowing she couldn't see it. And it's stuff like that that isn't anything I've done. Yeah. Uh, it's just there, and sometimes other people contribute to God's pocket. It isn't all ours, you know. It money comes from yeah. variety of places, and it just sits at God's pocket until there's a a need, uh, and it's one that kind of falls through the cracks. You know, if there was an easy solution that's already covered, well, then that solution right. should be used. Right. But this is for the people that it, it falls through the cracks, and and the one with the groceries was trying to go to seminary, oh. and trying to give his life to God, but his family couldn't eat, you know, it was just, and one time, that was all that was needed, just that boost, and then they got over the edge, and, and uh, sometimes I hear how it's being paid forward, sometimes I don't, but it doesn't matter to me, because it's God's work. Right, and you're just being just, obedient. To I'm just being yeah. obedient and spreading it out uh, somewhere else. And, yeah, and that's why I'm bringing this up, um, not, not for us to, you know, give these kinds of examples for no reason at all, but for, to, to encourage everybody who's doing this study to think of these two things um, can you think of times that God used you to meet the needs of others and can you think of times that you were used to God in the other way, yeah the other way around yeah both of them so um, I want to share a brief story and this is actually going to be the end of our lesson um, years ago I was listening to Chip Ingram who does a Bible ministry called Living on the Edge and he challenged the listeners to sit quietly before God for 10 minutes, remove all distractions, set a timer if you have to, and uh, read a section of scripture and then just sit quietly and see if the Lord prompts you to do anything or, or you know, respond just because we're so busy and distracted. Nobody has time for this kind of thing. So I took him at his word. You know, I, I set my little microwave timer and I sat down at the kitchen table for 10 minutes. And, um, and as I was sitting there, uh, the, the thought just came to my mind, people like your banana bread. What a weird thought. It wasn't something I was thinking about at all, but I was going to make a loaf later. So um, instead of making a loaf, I made four loaves. And um, as they were baking, names came to mind of people who I know who are going through a hard time or need to be encouraged or uh, for one reason or another, I just felt like I'm going to give them some banana bread. And so that was maybe 15 years ago, and that birthed... Uh, my banana bread ministry. <laughs> and I, I, when people say, that's so thoughtful of you, I want to say it, it wasn't me at all. I, the Lord prompts me. Um, so when I bake one for my family, I bake an extra one or two. And um, so now I have people giving me bananas, buying me flour when they go to Canada, because <laughs> the flour's better. Um, and all that just to um, encourage. People need to know they're cared about and encouraged. And God's love pour, should pour out of us. It pours into us, so it should pour out of us. And, but that's one of the main things is you have to take time to listen to the prompting. Right. You know, right. I, there's so easy to just run right through and miss so many opportunities. Right. That wouldn't take much from you, but you didn't even hear the prompt to say there was an opportunity. And it's not a legalistic transaction, and I'm not more pleasing to God because I'm doing no. this. Um, I'm only, I belong to him through Christ, faith in Christ, that's it. Uh, nothing I do is going to make God love me more or less. I just um, feel his favor, I guess, the, you know, the peace that uh, we're representing him. So. But when we do that, it brings glory to God. That's the goal. We don't it's always do the goal. that, but always. it's always what happens when yeah. we follow his prompt. Yeah, yeah. So ladies, our encouragement to you would be to think through these things and Spend a little time just listening for his still small voice. He may be um, prompting you to reach out to somebody who's struggling or, you know, needs a helping hand. Yeah. So that is Philippians. I am going to read one last section on page 87 here, and then we'll talk a little bit about what comes next. Uh, given much and giving much, Christians should, by their nature and their experience of grace, have a strong impulse to give to others to those in need, to the church as a whole, to missionaries, etc. Having been given so much in Christ, there is a desire to give much for Christ. Paul makes this very clear. Uh, Paul tells the sometimes stingy Corinthians about the exemplary generosity of the Macedonian churches. Despite their poverty, they gave in a wealth of generosity and with an abundance of joy. They gave of their own accord, even begging to be included in the relief of the more greatly impoverished saints in Jerusalem. Eventually, Brings, Paul brings his appeal to a fine gospel point. Giving 
like this proves that love is genuine. For you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. So having received greatly, give greatly, not as any kind of repayment for Christ's saving sacrifice, but with joy as an act of grace. Generosity should flow from the believer's confession of the gospel. With the Molly Hart. Yeah. And not to be confused with giving only means money. Right. You know, there's a lot time. more there than just money. Yeah. <laughs> time, talent, treasure. Um, there's lots of ways that we can show generosity to others. And we're called to just live generous lives because God's going to meet our needs. He's looking after us. All right. Do you want to talk about what happens now that we're finished with Philippians? Well, I'm going to point out those of you who do have the book, there is a week 12, which is basically a introverted Sorry. look at what you've gained from this whole study. So I would encourage everyone who has the book yep. to go through Lesson 12 on their own. Yep. Um, then, since we're finishing up this time and we can't picnic because we're all sheltering in place, um, I, we're turning our brains forward to what are we going to do in the fall. And we've the last few studies we did all the covenants. Uh, and God's united plan from beginning to end, and then we went into Proverbs and yep. spent some time there. We've now done the Philippians and spent some time there. Where do you want us to go in the fall? What kind of ideas do you have? Is there a particular theme or topic or a book of the Bible or whatever that touches you or that you'd like to know more about? And help us see if we can find a study that does that. So you can do that by either replying to the email if you get this through email, uh, you can comment on Facebook. If you see it on Facebook, we'll be looking for those comments. Um, we want to uh, open it up to new people, too. If, uh, if you haven't done this study in the past, but you're interested in plugging in in the fall, then we want to uh, hear from you and get some ideas. And we really hope and pray that this book of Philippians has been an encouragement to you uh, because God's strength is available, and he will meet all our needs, and it's out of his great love for us. Do you want to close us in prayer? I will, and we're looking forward to seeing you all face to face in the fall. Yes. I have every hope that we will be back to that format. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot the word. Oh, you didn't give the Learn word. Learn contentment. Yes. Contentment can be learned. Come to God for strength, and He will teach you to be content. Very good. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with each of us as we're going through these unique and strange times in our world today. Help us to figure out how in our particular circumstances we can be a wonderful example of your presence uh, for others. That we can uh, reach out in whatever ways we can in the current restrictions. And that we can feel content um, despite all the changes and despite all the circumstances that we're sitting in. Help us to deep down feel that peace and contentment that we know you are providing for us through every day of this strange time. We ask you to uh, walk with each of those listening here and the ones they love and help them to uh, be safe, be healthy, and be tuned on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.